Russian, Japanese, Spanish, and English. I know touching. Oh! I love languages. I, I mean, I would think of things like kindness. I would think of things like um, forgiveness. I think a hug, a kiss, a smile. Well, thank you, thank you. Let me tell you up front what I hope is going to happen in the brief time that we spend together. My first desire is that your marriage will get better. Would that be all right with you? Just starting where you are, that things would get a little better? You know, marriages either get better or they get worse. They never stand still. And I certainly hope your marriage won't get worse because I came. I hope it'll get better. My second desire is that you will learn some things that you will find so helpful that you will want to share them with your friends who are not here, but who desperately need what we're talking about, okay? And my third desire is that we can have a little fun while we do this. Now, I meet people who don't believe in fun, but I can tell you're not that kind of audience, okay? So I hope we can have a little fun together. Now, our topic tonight is the most important word in the English language and the most confusing word in the English language. I say that love is the most important word because if you examine our literature, our music, our theater, our religions, our philosophies, all of them make much of love. But I say that love is the most confusing word in our language because we use the word love in a thousand ways. We say, for example, I love hot dogs. And then we say, I love my mother. I think there's a difference. Hot dogs and mothers? Now, I'm not going to discuss a thousand ways in which we use the word love. I'm going to discuss only one way, and that is love as an emotional need. Dr. Ross Campbell, psychiatrist who spent 30 years working with children and adolescents, says that he believes that inside every child there is an emotional love tank. And if the love tank is full, that is, if the child genuinely feels loved by the parents, the child grows up normally. But if the love tank is empty and the child does not feel loved by the parents, the child will grow up with many internal struggles. And in the teenage years, the child will go looking for love, typically in all the wrong places. I think he's right. But I also believe that adults have a love tank. And if you're married, the person you would most like to love you is your spouse. In fact, if you feel loved by your spouse, your love tank is full, the whole world looks bright. But if the love tank is empty and you don't feel loved by your spouse, the whole world begins to look dark. So the question is, how can we keep the love tank full? One of my interests through the years has been ancient Greek literature. Some years ago, I discovered a letter that was written in the first century by one of the leaders in the Christian church. It was written to a young pastor by the name of Titus. And the letter said to the pastor, I want to encourage you to get together all the older ladies in the church. I've often wondered how Titus went about that. What would you do? Get up on Sunday morning and say, I'd like for all the old ladies to meet me by the piano. I don't think so. But he said, I want you to get together all the older ladies in the church and tell them that they are to teach the young ladies to love their husbands and to love their children. Do you understand the implications of that? If you happen to be a young wife and you're having trouble loving your husband, maybe you should find an older lady who knows how and let her teach you. And if you happen to be an older lady, I don't know that we have any here, but if you happen to be an older lady and you don't know how to teach young ladies to love their husbands, 
I hope you'll listen because that's one of your jobs is to teach the young ladies. But I want you to listen to the second phrase. It said, teach them to love their children. What? A mother has to have a class in loving her children? I thought a mother's love was just natural. What is it that must be learned about loving children? I believe it is how to express love in a language the child will feel. Have you not seen this in your community? A teenager runs away from home, and the parents are wringing their hands saying, how could they do this to us after all we've done for them? And the teenager is on the other side of town in some counselor's office saying, my parents don't love me. They never have loved me. They love my brother. They don't love me. Now, do the parents love the teenager? Almost always, yes. What's the problem? Chances are they have not been communicating love in a language that teenager will feel. Maybe they've been giving ball gloves and bicycles to show their love. And maybe the teenager is saying inside, I wish someone would play ball with me. I wish someone would go riding with me. You understand the difference between giving a child a ball glove and playing ball with a child? Perhaps the difference between the child feeling love and not feeling love. So what we want to talk about is how do you communicate love so that children feel love and in marriage so that the spouse will feel love. I want to share with you what I call the five emotional love languages. After 30 plus years of marriage and family counseling, I'm convinced there are only five fundamental ways to express love emotionally. I call them love languages. Now, there are many dialects within the five languages, but there's only five fundamental languages. I want to share them with you. Number one is words of affirmation. Using words to affirm the other person. Ladies, I don't want you to raise your hand, but I want to ask you a question. Has he said anything similar to this in the last week? You look nice in that outfit. Guys, I don't want you to raise your hand, but has she said anything similar to this in the last week? Ooh, do you ever look tough tonight? I can tell that's new for some of you ladies. <laughs> Let's have all the ladies try this out loud. Here we go, ladies, all together. Ooh, do you ever look tough tonight? Yeah, now try that one on. Words of affirmation. You know, honey, you have got to be the best potato cook in the world. I love these potatoes. Thanks for taking the garbage out. Not about time you took the garbage out, the flies are going to carry it out for you. <laughs> Words that build up the other person. Some years ago, I demonstrated the power of words to myself. I had a lady who, come, who came in, and she sat down and said to me, Dr. Chapman, I can't get my husband to paint our bedroom. Well, my first thought was, lady, you're in the wrong place. I am not a paint contractor. But I said to her, well, tell me about it. She said, well, last Saturday was a good example. She said, you remember how pretty it was last Saturday? She said, he washed and waxed the car all day long. I said, so what did you do? She said, I went out there and said, Bob, I don't understand you. Today would have been a perfect day to paint the bedroom, and here you are washing and waxing the car. I said, so? Did he paint the bedroom? She said, no, it's still not painted. I said, well, let me ask you some questions. I said, uh, are you opposed to clean waxed cars? And she said, well, no, but I want the bedroom painted. I said, are you sure that your husband knows that you want the bedroom painted? And she said, I know he does. I've been after him for nine months. I said, well, let me ask you one more question. Does your husband ever do anything right? And she said, like what? 
I said, well, do, does he ever take the dog for a walk or does he ever pay the electrical bill or does he ever take his plate from the den to the kitchen? I said, does he ever do anything good? And she said, well, yeah, he, he does some of those things. I said, well, then I, I have two suggestions for you. I said, number one, don't ever mention painting the bedroom again. Don't ever mention it again. She said, well, I don't see how that's going to work. I said, look, you just told me that you know that he knows that you want the bedroom painted. So you don't have to tell him again. He knows that. I said, the second suggestion is the next time he does anything good, you give him a verbal compliment. You just say, Bob, I appreciate you taking the dog for a walk. You just give him a verbal compliment. And she said, well, I don't see how that's going to get the bedroom painted. I said, look, you asked for my advice. It's free. She left. She wasn't very happy with me, but she left. Three weeks later, I saw her in the hallway, and she said to me, it worked. <laughs> Now, ladies, I am not talking manipulation. I hate to inform you, ladies, but you cannot make a man paint a bedroom. But I'm telling you this, words of affirmation are far greater motivators than are nags. So I want to challenge you to learn to speak words of affirmation. A second love language is gifts. My academic background is anthropology, the study of cultures. We have never discovered a culture in which gift giving is not an expression of love. It's universal to give gifts as an expression of love. The gift says, she was thinking about me. Look what she got for me. Now, the gift need not be expensive. Haven't we always said it's the thought that counts? But I remind you, it is not the thought left in your head that counts. It's the gift that came out of the thought in your head. Hey, guys, you can get a nice card now for $5. You can't afford $5 for the card? Make your own card. Don't you remember how you fold the paper like this, take the scissors like this, open up the heart and write, I love you? How much does that cost? Get the paper out of the trash can where you work. <laughs> or, you know, you, you can get flowers a good part of the year. You can get flowers free. Just go out in your backyard and pick one. That's what your kids do. How many mothers have ever gotten a dandelion from your kids? Yeah. Now, guys, I'm not suggesting dandelions, okay? <laughs> you don't have any flowers in your yard? Your neighbors are. <laughs> ask them. They'll give you a flower. Or you could go to a funeral and ask the family. They'll give you a flower. <laughs> Gifts is one of the fundamental languages of love. A third love language is acts of service. Doing something for your spouse that you know they would like for you to do. For example, cooking a meal is an act of service. Big act of service. Incidentally, does anybody here still cook? You remember the old saying, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach and the way to a woman's heart is through the restaurant door? Yes. <laughs> Acts of service. Washing dishes is an act of service. Who washes dishes at your place? Puts them in the dishwasher, all that good stuff. Yeah. Vacuuming floors is an act of service. Getting white spots off the mirror getting bugs off the windshield of the car they drive, trimming the shrubs, mowing the grass, washing the car, walking the dog, changing the baby's diaper. Woo, big act of service. <laughs> Anything you know your spouse would like for you to do, how do you know what they would like? They've been grumbling about it for years. You should know by now. Love language number four is quality time by which I mean you give them your undivided attention. I don't mean sitting on the couch watching television. Someone else has your attention. I'm talking about sitting on the couch with the TV off, looking at each other and talking. Do you all have couches? 
What do you do with those things? Have you ever tried this, sitting on the couch with the TV off, looking at each other? It can be scary at first, <laughs> looking at each other. Are the two of you taking a walk down the road together? Are going out to eat and sitting and looking and talking to each other? Incidentally, have you ever noticed in a restaurant, you can almost always tell the difference between dating couples and married couples. <laughs> dating couples will look at each other and talk. Married couples sit there and you'd think they went there to eat. If I sit on the couch with my wife and I give her 20 minutes looking, listening, interacting with her, I have given her 20 minutes of my life and she has done the same for me. It's a powerful communicator when you give someone your undivided attention. Now, if you're giving quality time to children, you have to go to where the children are because they can't come to where you are. Remember when they're little and you're sitting on the floor rolling the ball back and forth? Whee! That's right, honey. Whee! That's right. Whee! That child has your undivided attention. You may run a million dollar business down the road, but right now that child has your undivided attention. Now, if the telephone rings and you start talking on the phone while you roll the ball, the child no longer has your undivided attention. It's a powerful communicator to give someone your full attention. Love language number five is physical touch. We have long known the emotional power of physical touch. That's why we pick up babies and hold them and cuddle them and say all those silly words. And long before the baby understands the meaning of the word love, the baby feels love by physical touch. Now in marriage, I'm talking about holding hands. I'm talking about kissing, embracing. I'm talking about putting your arm around their shoulder or running your hand through their hair. I'm talking about sexual intercourse. I'm talking about driving down the road and just reaching over and putting your hand on their leg. Or you're sitting around the house and they walk by and you just trip them. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I can demonstrate the power of physical touch right now. Just reach out and touch your spouse anywhere. Now, I didn't say poke them. I said touch them. Does that feel all right? Okay, break it up, break it up. <laughs> now, listen to me carefully. Out of those five love languages, each of us has what I call a primary love language. One of the five is more important to us emotionally than the other four. Now, we can receive love in all five, but if we had to give up something, we would give up this one and this one, but not this one. That's the one that really makes me feel love. That is your primary love language. It's very similar to spoken language. Everyone grows up speaking a language with a dialect, okay? I grew up speaking English, Southern style. But everybody grows up speaking a language and a dialect, and that's the one you understand best. The same is true with love. Now, once in a while, someone says to me, I don't know, Gary, I think two of those are just about equal for me. And my response is, fine, we'll give you two love languages. We'll call you bilingual. <laughs> but most of us have a primary love language, a secondary love language, and then the other three fall in line under that. Now, please listen to me carefully. In marriage, almost never does a husband and wife have the same love language. It happens, but not very often. And by nature, we speak our language. But if it is not his or her primary language, it will not mean to them what it would mean to us. Now let me illustrate. Here's a girl who grew up in a home where she didn't feel loved by her father. And yet every morning her father would say to her, I love you, honey. Have a good day. Words. But if she didn't feel loved, obviously words is not her primary love language. 
Ten years later, she's married, but she feels unloved by her husband. But if she says to him, honey, I just feel like you don't love me anymore, he will likely say, don't love you? What are you talking about? Every morning I tell you that I love you, and every afternoon that's the first thing I say when I get home. What do you mean don't love you? And he's very sincere. The problem is not his sincerity. The problem is he's speaking the wrong love language. You see, he's giving her words, and maybe her language is acts of service. If so, what she's thinking is, if he loved me, he would do something around here. Look at him watching television while I work. I mean, what does he think this is? I mean, if he loved me, he would do something. It never crossed his mind to do something. His father told him, men don't wash dishes. Men don't vacuum floors. Never crossed his mind to do something to help her. So she has an empty love tank, and he loves her as sincerely as he can. But he's not speaking the right language. Let me give you another illustration. Here's a husband. Let's say his, his language is physical touch. But let's say that his wife is very cold and non-responsive physically. It won't be long till he will feel unloved. But if he says to her, Honey, I just feel like you don't love me anymore. She may well say, Don't love you? Cook your meals, wash your clothes, and don't love you? What do you think that is? And she's being very sincere. The problem? She's speaking her language, not his language. You see, what he's thinking is, you know, woman, I could send the shirts out. I could go to the restaurant, you know, and eat. What I want is love. You understand why I would say that there are literally thousands of couples who are loving each other, but they're not connecting. In fact, in the early years of marriage, almost always couples are loving each other. But I can tell you this, many of them are not connecting. And after a while, the love tank is empty. And when they bring it up to the other person, they will say, what are you talking about don't love you? And they will rattle off what they think they're doing to show love. And they are. You see, it's not enough to be sincere. We have to learn how to speak the other person's love language. And if we don't learn to speak the right language, we may be sincerely loving each other, and yet we, we are living with empty love tanks. Now, I'm going to give you a little exercise, and later on you can do this going to suggest something to you, that when, you, when you're together, that first of all, you guess each other's language. Maybe even write it down, what you think their language is, okay? Then you sit down and you share with each other what you think your own love language is. Then I'm going to suggest that you take the love language profile, which is a set of 30 questions where you make a choice between two things. For example, I feel loved when you hug me. Or I feel loved when we take a walk together. One is physical touch, the other is quality time. But if you can only have one of those, which one are you going to choose? So you make 30 choices and it tells you what your love language is, okay? It just affirms that you understand yourself. Then I'm going to give you a little game to play. The game is called tank check. We're going to check the love tank. And here's the way you play the game. I'm going to suggest you play the game three days a week for three weeks. If you play it for three weeks, you'll be hooked on it. Here's the way the game goes. One of you says to the other, Honey, zero to ten, how's your love tank tonight? Now, 10 means I'm just full of love. Can't handle any more love tonight. <laughs> full of love. <laughs> Zero means totally empty. Now, if your spouse says anything less than 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, whatever they say, you say, what could I do to help fill it? And they give you a suggestion. And to the best of your ability, you do what they suggest. Now, one guy came back. He said, boy, I don't like that tank check game. 
He said, I played that thing with my wife, and I said, zero to ten, you know, how's your love tank? And she said, about seven. And I said, well, honey, what could I do to help fill it? And she said, honey, the greatest thing you could do for me tonight is to do the laundry. He said, laundry and love, I don't get it. <laughs> and I said, that's the problem. That's the whole problem. Now, guys, I don't know how you feel. But if washing a load of clothes every night would keep my wife's love tank full, bring on the laundry. I'd do a load of clothes every night to live with a happy woman. <laughs> you see, some of you guys, it's been a long time since you lived with a wife who had a full love tank. I'm going to tell you this, guys. If you ever get your wife's love tank full, you will never want another woman. You will have another woman. <laughs> Wives are radically different when their love tanks are full. And some of you ladies, it's been a long time since he's had a full love tank. And he's kind of moaning and groaning, and you're saying to yourself, oh, man, another day with this guy. I'm telling you, ladies, if you ever get his love tank full, you will have a new husband. I mean, men are different when their love tank is full. So I want to challenge you to play that game and to learn how to keep each other's love tank full. Now, I can imagine that some of you are saying, yes, Gary, but what if the love language of your spouse is something that just doesn't come natural for you? And my answer, so you learn to speak it. My wife's love language is acts of service, okay? One of the things I do for her is vacuum the floors. Now, you don't know me well, but I want to ask you, do you think that vacuuming floors comes natural for me? <laughs> my mother made me vacuum. All through junior high and high school, I couldn't go play ball on Saturday until I vacuumed the house. In those days, I said to myself, if I ever get out of here, <laughs> one thing I'm not going to do, I'm not going to vacuum floors. You could not pay me enough to vacuum floors. There's only one reason I vacuum floors. L-O-V-E. You see, when it doesn't come natural, it's a greater expression of love. My wife knows every time I vacuum the floor, it's nothing but 100% pure, unadulterated love, and I get credit for the whole thing. <laughs> but I can imagine some wife is saying, yeah, Gary, but that's a little different. I'm just afraid that my spouse's language might be physical touch, and I am not a toucher. I didn't grow up in a touchy-feely family. What am I going to do? Well, do you have two hands? Can you put them together? Now, let's just imagine that you get him in the middle. Or if you can't get them all the way around, kind of like this. <laughs> and I bet if you'll hug him a few thousand times, it'll begin to feel a little more comfortable. But ultimately, we're not talking comfort. We're talking love. And love is something you do for somebody else, not something you do for yourself. Folks, I don't va vacuum floors for me. I vacuum floors for her. Fuzzy balls don't bother me. <laughs> Once a year is all I would ever need to vacuum. I can walk all over fuzzy balls. I vacuum every week for her, not for me. Love something you do for someone else, not something you do for yourself. Now, when we apply this to children, how do you discover a child's love language? Well, I normally say in the first three years, you just pour on all five and you're bound to hit it. But along about four, you can easily discover a child's love language. Let me suggest uh, three ways to do that. Number one is you observe the child's behavior. How does the child express love to you? If they are always giving you gifts, then that may be their love language. If they're, if they're always hugging you, then physical touch may be their love language. Observe how they express love to you. A second observation is, what do they request of you most often? 
If they say to you, come into my room, I want to show you something. They're asking you for quality time. If you get ready to go on a trip and they say, be sure and bring me a surprise, they're telling you that gifts may well be their language. So what do they request of you? And then observe them as they play with other children. If they are always patting people on the back, physical touch may be their language. If they are giving encouraging words to their friends and say, you did a good job with that, then words may be their language. If you put those three things together, very likely you can discover a child's love language. I discovered our son's love language when he was about four. You know how I discovered it? When I would come home in the afternoon, he would run up to me and jump on me and mess up my hair. He's touching me because he wants to be touched, physical touch. Our daughter would never do that. Our daughter, when I got home in the afternoon, would say, Daddy, come into my room. I want to show you what I'm doing. She wanted quality time. So you can learn it rather early. That's why, as my daughter got older, we would take walks together. When she was in high school, we would take walks about three afternoons a week. After, after dinner and after I washed dishes for my wife, we would take walks together. <laughs> now, my son would never walk with me. He said, walking is dumb. You're not going anywhere. If you're going somewhere, drive. <laughs> you see, that wasn't his love language. Now, they're both grown now, but when they come home, if my son is at home and lying in the floor watching television and I walk through the room, he trips me. You understand what he's doing? Hey, Dad, get out here and wrestle with me. Now, my daughter, when she comes home, you know what she'll say? Dad, could we take a walk together? You bet we can. But you see, we have to learn the love language of the children and express love in their language. So here's the conclusion, that if we learn to speak the love language of our spouses and our children, we change the emotional climate in the home. I'm telling you that what I have just shared with you could literally save thousands of marriages. In fact, my files are filled with letters and emails from people who have said to me, Dr. Chapman, I don't know you, but I read your book on the five love languages and it literally turned our marriage around. You see, because we so desperately need love, it's the deepest emotional need we have, the need to feel loved. And because when we're married, we desperately want to feel loved by our spouse. When they start speaking our love language, the love tank begins to fill up and the whole emotional climate changes in a marriage. Whether you've been married for 30 years or for three months, what I've just shared with you has the potential of changing the climate in your marriage. So I wanna challenge you to apply this in your own marriage, and then I wanna challenge you to share this idea with your friends who need to feel loved fully as much as you do. Now, if you found this session helpful, I hope you'll stay with us for the other sessions because, because we're going to dig a little deeper into all of this, okay? I also want to invite you to my marriage seminars. I do seminars all over the country on Saturday, 9 o'clock until 3.30. And if you want to know where I'm going to be doing seminars, you can go to GaryChapman.org, O-R-G, okay? And you, you can find my schedule. We talk about such things as, all he thinks about is sex. And how to resolve conflicts without arguing. Wouldn't that be nice? And how to get your spouse to change without manipulating them. Mmm, wouldn't that be good? Have lots of fun in the Saturday seminars. Hope you'll join us sometime. And I hope you'll continue to join us in these sessions. Thank you. Mm -hmm.